Okay, well, it's my great pleasure to be here, before I get mic'd up, uh, that this is a new venue for me, that I'm um, a new adjunct professor teaching international marine environmental law at uh, the Moderate Middlebury Institute for International Studies, but my occupation for the past 10 to 12 years has been working in the halls of the United Nations trying to um, both encourage application of the best available science, but also to, in many ways, promote a new international treaty for high seas conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity. And that's what I'll be focusing on today, and the role of science diplomacy um, in the next stages, because in January of this year, governments did agree at the United Nations to launch negotiations for this new treaty. But what it contains is still up in the air, and how we move forward in many ways depends on how we can galvanize international cooperation to understand why it is we should care and how we can all benefit from moving ahead. And I've moved backwards instead. Okay. All right, um, so this is what I'm going to try to talk about. I'm giving you my top level messages straight off in case David steps on my toes for going on for too long. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> um, that was basically that science diplomacy is abs absolutely vital. I may be new to this field, but I did discover that I have been engaged in this um, since I became involved in the Census of Marine Life in the last two years of its operation, where the Census of Marine Life was collecting information and data and exploration on the abundance, distribution, and patterns of marine life. <coughs> It's, his, uh, it's past, present, and future. And I helped them to sort of understand that this data did in fact have a role in policy making and um, trying to help improve the state of conservation in the marine environment. Um, my work beyond national jurisdiction is going that it, it really is an area of common concern of all of humanity. How we are managing it does affect the welfare of us all. Whoops. Um, Sorry, that the Law of the Sea Convention does provide a very firm and um, solid basis for a cooperation and action. But for those of us who have been involved in these fields, it is time to modernize it and upgrade it with some of the laws and principles and norms that have evolved in other sectoral uh, um, organizations, such as transparency and precaution. Uh, science diplomacy has already played a significant role in getting us to where we are today, which is the launch of the new agreement, but also trying to address some of the most pressing threats to marine biodiversity. Um, but that as we're going into the process of developing this new international treaty, science diplomacy will um, certainly become even more important. That, so in terms of marine biodiversity, why I'm calling it the common concern of humanity is if you look at the high seas, it truly is two-thirds of the global ocean. And scientists um, in uh, Intergovernment Oceanographic Commission call this one ocean because the ocean is connected. We may call it seven different oceans, but in reality, they do influence and interact um, as one. The high seas is the water column, beyond, generally beyond 200 nautical miles, the exclusive economic <coughs> zone. Uh, the seabed area is an often another um, is a hugely important area. It's beyond the legal continental shelf that Paul was trying to show us on the map. But what's important is that under the Law of the Sea Convention, the negotiators, the drafters, the politicians, and the scientists of the time de declared the area, the seabed area, and its mineral resources as part of the common heritage of mankind. So you have contrasting legal regimes for your high seas water column and your deep seabed below. And the interesting thing to note about the seabed area is it is to be administered by an international agency, the International <coughs> Seabed Authority, on behalf of humankind. And what that means, we don't know yet, but we're just going into the stage of potential exploitation of seabed minerals. And we do have many questions that need to be addressed in terms of who is ultimately going to benefit from this new industry. Um, high seas and us, why is it important? I mean, this is just one of the many studies done for the um, Global Ocean Commission, but looking at its value in the carbon storehouse um, heat storage, keeping the temperatures on land bearable for us, food security, providing um, fish and other nutritional elements, but also 
um, because the high seas are so vast, 68% of the fish stocks are thought to be straddling both exclusive economic zones and the high seas, so that overfishing in the high seas can undermine the sustainability of fisheries inside national jurisdictions. And of course, it's a huge habitat, the largest habitat for life on Earth, with an amazing array of marine and coastal species. That's but, um, like areas on land, it is not immune to human um, degradation. Uh, this article that came out in Science in um, January sort of showed the patterns of defaunation, they call the loss of your uh, large megafauna, but also the, lo the smaller species that maintain the integrity of ecosystems is accelerating as human impacts on both land and sea um, accelerate. That's, um, it didn't happen as quickly on sea, but in many ways we have more to worry about now because the ocean has been absorbing all of this heat and absorbing all of the CO2 um, that is going through very many rapid changes. And scientists working on the deep sea think that climate change and acidification are going to be um, very significant impacts in the very near future, far outweighing what we're doing um, with fisheries. But their point is that you need to be able to address the near-term direct impacts at the same time as you're trying to reduce CO2 emissions. Um, the story often looks bleak. We got the headline um, news in the New York Times about the ocean faces mass extinction based on this Macaulay article. That's what the scientists here were very cautious in trying to provide some rays of hope is that we do have tools that we have applied in the past. We can apply them uh, within national jurisdiction, marine protected areas, fisheries effort controls, new gear types, spatial management and planning so you don't have conflicts of uses. But we need to take them up and use them seriously. However, areas beyond national jurisdiction, we have many more impediments. That's, um, but we also have the Law of the Sea Convention, which does provide the basic fundamental um, governing system, if you will, for all activities um, in the marine sphere. And it also lays down a fundamental duty to protect and preserve the marine environment. It has been supplemented twice, with, first with respect to seabed mining uh, through a 1994 agreement and the 1995 agreement on highly migratory and straddling fish stocks was there specifically to update and elaborate on the provisions of the Law of the Sea Convention that talked about the duty to cooperate, to conserve, and to um, add in precautionary activities, precautionary fisheries management, and ecosystem-based management approaches. We don't have those yet for general activities in the law of um, beyond national jurisdiction. This is just to repeat uh, Paul's um, description of areas out to the limits of the continental shelf as being part of the national interest and the areas beyond the area and the water column above having much greater intrinsic international interest that require international conservation to manage their activities. The Law of the Sea Convention lays out the freedoms of states to have their vessels fish in the high seas, to sail in the high seas, to um, conduct marine scientific research. But what is often neglected is that these um, freedoms are not absolute. They are conditioned by the duties under the Law of the Sea Convention to protect and preserve the marine environment, to um, conserve living marine resources, to cooperate, and to comply with convention and other rules of international law. So it's really trying to balance these two um, concepts of freedoms as well as duties that is part of the problem that we're confronted with today. Uh, the Law of the Sea Convention does not stand alone. It is one instrument that may be overarching, but it is supplemented by, as we were saying, um, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement for Fisheries, the Part 11 Agreement for Seabed Mining. We won't go into detail on those. That's another um, long course in international marine environment law. But um, I will talk a little bit more about regional fisheries management organizations here and um, Convention on Biological Diversity. Convention on Biological Diversity um, has many of the elements that one would like to see. It talks about conserving biodiversity, about sustainable use, about um, biodiversity conservation being the common concern of mankind. However, it basically stops at 200 nautical miles. Its provisions dealing with components of biodiversity, the genes, the species, the habitats, 
are directly made applicable to areas within national jurisdiction. So we have this gap in international law that the rules with respect to conservation, marine protected areas, are limited by application, by deliberate application under the Convention on Biological Diversity. But that doesn't mean we're without power because science diplomacy has already played a significant role with respect to protection <coughs> of ecosystems like this. I started my transition from maritime law into marine conservation by falling in love with tropical coral reefs and the fish that swim around them. Um, and then I was working in um, the field of shipping and protecting the marine environment from shipping <coughs> aspects. But in 2001, I went to this workshop in the Baltic Sea and learned to my um, amazement that there are these incredible white coral reefs, white and pink, if you will, in Norway, the half of my heritage. Um, that's in Norway and in many parts of the deep ocean on seamounts and tropical cor um, and deep water coral reefs. They can survive in waters um, four degrees centigrade. Um, but at the same time, the scientists are saying these are being destroyed uh, by fishers who are taking two ships and deep um, metal chains, steel chains, to rake the seabed in order to make sure that their nets did not caught on the seabed while they were bottom trawling. Um, and so this was brought to the attention by both the fishers who were using long lines, but also huge concern by the scientists themselves. And what it resulted in was the United Nations General Assembly um, adopting a series of resolutions to rein in the worst impacts of bottom fishing by calling on states and regional fisheries management organizations who were responsible for actually managing the activities beyond national jurisdiction to take a series of measures or not authorize bottom <laughs> fishing to proceed. Um, that's an important one that we'll come back to. Um, but where science comes in, one, it was helping to define what is a vulnerable marine ecosystem, what is a significant adverse impact. And these were the criteria that were developed through scientific expert groups um, by the um, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. At the same time, the Convention on Biological Diversity was working up with similar problems. They were outraged by deep sea bottom trawling, wanted to take action, but they couldn't. They can't regulate anybody, but they could adopt and supply scientific and technical information about important marine areas in the deep sea and the open ocean. And so these are the criteria they developed in 2008 and then set up a process to actually apply these across the open ocean and deep sea. So what we ended up by 2014 were over 200 areas ident described as being of ecological or biological significance in need of enhanced management and protection. The problem is we have this information, data, the best available scientific information, but at present there's no place to lodge it or to make sure that it's actually being taken into consideration in management processes. But you can always start small and try to scale up. So one of the things that we've done is to try to focus on one particular area of the marine environment to pool together through the Sargasso Sea Alliance the best available scientific information about the um, role and value of the sargassum weed, about the species like humpback whales or um, corb eagle sharks um, who are swimming through or uh, spawning or uh, mating in the Sargasso Sea itself. That's building the science case then supplying it to the Convention on Biological Diversity for input into their registry on areas of ecological significance. In 2014, <laughs> uh, we have our next speaker here, um, Ambassador Dave Balton, who with four other governments joined in the signing of the Hamilton Declaration, which is simply calling for collaboration between the signatories to this Hamilton Declaration for the conservation of the Sargasso Sea. Um, the importance of this is sort of it's the first independent effort to try to better manage on a spatial basis uh, a very large area of the ocean. The Sargasso Sea is two million square, not a, uh, square miles. That's, but again, we're trying to apply and utilize the best available scientific information. And part of the Sargasso Sea, the Hamilton Declaration, was the establishment of the Sargasso Sea Commission of five scientific and legal experts who are there, you know, technically as stewards 
of the Sargasso Sea, trying to maintain an eye on what is happening in the Sargasso Sea to alert the international community, as well as to provide the basis for developing proposals for action through the uh, various competent organizations managing fishing, shipping, etc. Uh, what they've done to date has been collecting information on who is fishing for what inside of the Sargasso Sea. But unfortunately, what they discovered is these areas with the crops hatching here with respect to deep sea bottom fishing were supposedly closed, but they were 20% were theoretically open to fishing, but nobody had been paying attention to it, and it had been subject to some significant fishing by um, Spanish fleets. In the area in this um, International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna, we submitted proposals for consideration, additional information, and they promised they will come back to us in 2015, November, for um, consideration of the Sargasso Sea as a pilot study for ecosystem-based management in the context of fisheries, uh, which is a little bit embarrassing because 1995, the date for the fish stocks agreement, was actually calling for ecosystem-based management, but at least now they are making progress and starting to talk about implementing ecosystem-based management. Um, so we have the information, much of the information we have is already usable, but it's a question of trying to create the common principles and framework to make sure that it's actually being implemented. So many of us have been working at the United Nations to encourage a process to develop a new international legally binding agreement, and this was um, through a so-called UN working group to study issues related to conservation sustainable use. This working group was established in 2004, met periodically every two years for the first initial years, and just recently started to gather steam, meeting twice a year, and finally, as we were saying, in 2015, in the, dead of, in, in the midst of a raging winter storm, one of the first storms of um, the January season, uh, governments finally agreed at 2.45 a.m. that it was time indeed to launch um, the development of a new international instrument under the Law of the Sea Convention for the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity. Um, the treaty is supposed to address five different elements, uh, including area-based management tools, marine protected areas and other sectoral tools, environmental impact assessments, marine genetic resources and the sharing of benefits and um, access, capacity building, and technology transfer. And of course, the reason why I think Paul invited me today is to talk about what are the challenges and opportunities for science diplomacy in this context. That was, it does look fairly daunting when you're trying to manage two thirds of the ocean, but if you're like me, you're an eternal optimist, at least if you're up at the top of the hill, you have a better view. Uh, so I'll try to ch share some of my perspectives on how do we apply some of these concepts of science diplomacy. And one is just simply providing a common shared understanding of the importance of the ocean and what climate change, ocean acidification are doing to the health, productivity, and resilience of the ecosystems and species upon which many of us rely or admire and eat, um, that the ocean is changing rapidly. We've had the um, census of marine life, the 10 years of research, we've had IPCC reports about climate change impacts on the oceans. Sometime this year we'll have the outcomes of the World Ocean Assessment. The United Nations has been working on this for many, many years, underfunded, but finally it's sort of the culminating view of marine scientists about past, present, future of the, the marine um, environment. It is a huge opportunity to try to bring awareness to the table. Uh, but in the meantime, we can actually apply the scientific information that we have by utilizing the information gathered by the Convention on Biological Diversity about areas of ecological or biological significance. We're working on the Sargasso Sea, but there are many other areas that need immediate and urgent attention. But we also have, and I'd love to learn from you, some of the challenges of making sure that any scientific or technical advice remains non-politicized that um, I can see that it is already a um, problem in the International Seabed Authority where they have their mandate to manage for the um, benefit of humankind, but 
in the body that is responsible for developing regulations for exploitation, there are 14 geologists and only three environmental scientists. Uh, the, m many of the members of the Legal and Technical Commission are reportedly to be also employed by people who are contractors in, um, who are interested in exploitation of the minerals themselves. You need that sort of expertise, but it should not be behind closed doors. It should not be um, open only to a very small number of individuals, but needs to be open and transparent, at least in, in my mind. But we need to find out what is the best available information on making those non-politicized. Um, then finally, trying to look at how do you facilitate international collaboration on marine science. As I said, the Census of Marine Life was an amazing endeavor with 80 plus uh, countries, 2,700 scientists involved in really trying to look in every nook and cranny of the ocean. But if you look at what OBIS, the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, has in terms of the data, you'll find that most of it is still white space. Most of it remains unknown. And so the challenge in part is, as we're going into seabed mining, what um, will the impacts be on an area of the ocean that we know practically nothing about? That's there are new um, discoveries coming about the deep pelagic realm. Uh, we're learning that these huge migrations of fish um, that are providing food for commercial species, that are storing carbon way down in the deep sea where we want it to stay, um, but hugely unknown biodiversity and potential for many different uh, resources, but also um, we really have no idea of what the impact of mining may be, the mining plumes on a large number of species that are really diaphanous in nature. That's they live off their um, filter feeding and what they can get from the marine environment. We also need information to better understand direct and cumulative impacts. Uh, thus, we have people working with uh, Ben Halpern, that's this information needs to be updated. We're looking at how do you develop environmental impact assessments? How do you start to determine both what your direct impact is when you know so little about the marine environment, but how do you start determining the cumulative impacts? And then how do you start to understand and grapple with the role and importance of the ocean in the context of climate change, as well as the impacts of ocean acidification global warming and the interactions between the, the many things. And then finally, looking at how do you enhance benefit sharing and access to marine genetic resources. I'd be very interested in, in learning more about the um, database and, and the rules for sharing genetic information and materials and how we could actually start applying it to areas beyond national jurisdiction. That's, and then lastly, lastly, is using science cooperation as a mechanism to improve international relations between countries. Uh, we've had decla decades of exploration um, to the moon, decla decades of exploration of the census marine life, but we really haven't had an intensive investigation of the deep seabed and the water column above and its interaction with the pelagic zone where we're living. We still know basically nothing about these creatures that live off the methane that is now seeping from the seabed. Um, but we, what we do know is it's bringing countries such as Russia, the United States, Argentina, and Cuba to the table in shared interest about the fate and future of our shared ocean commons. So I'm a firm believer with um, my uh, recent introduction to science diplomacy and its many faces. And I'd love to learn more about how we can start to apply it in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you.